My biggest takeaway was it feels like Mac Jones does not have support throughout various levels of the organization. Uh, put another way, I feel like he no longer has support from the majority of the organization. Is that a fair characterization? That is, because I spoke to someone just last night after the story came out, and we spoke at length, and that was one person among, um, I would say, at least a few, but probably many, because you can only speak to so many people, that is firmly out on Mac. Like, they're over it. They, they don't think he's the answer. He's not someone helping the team. They know they're not alone in that. But two things. They're not a decision maker, and they also know that Bailey Zappi is not any better. And so that's where the Patriots are, is really stuck between a bad quarterback and a worse one. Okay, well, just real quick. When you say you talk to somebody, whether it was last night or, or over time, the, the support that is waning with Mac Jones exists in the locker room with the players, correct? Some players and other, other places in the organization, yes. Andrew, one thing that jumped out at me in your story was your description of the lack of statistics and analytics mm. that the scouting department, the front office, depends on when they're evaluating talent to bring into the building. I, I guess my first question is, how does that stack up against other franchises in your understanding in the league? Like, who's an example of a franchise that does this extremely well? And then where are the Patriots on the spectrum of... Like, guys who barely do it at all. So, a couple franchises that are, are as all-in as you really can get in an analytics are the Eagles and the Browns. And where the Patriots fall on the spectrum are certainly in the bottom half and closer to the bottom than I realize because the Crafts have a sports analytics company that's next door to the football uh, facility. And so, my understanding is that they had a small analytics staff uh, going back a few years who then all left. And they dabbled in it a little bit towards the end of Nick Casario's run as, you know, de facto GM, director of player personnel, and have since kind of scrapped it. And they're going by the tape. They're going by the old school nature. And they do have GPS tracking. Like, that's how they monitor how many miles guys have run or steps they've taken during practice. They run out every single day. But when it comes to evaluating talent, my understanding is that they've gone away from the analytics. And as other teams invest more and more and use this kind of cutting-edge information and data, which are all tools. It's not, it doesn't dictate what you think, but it helps you form decisions that the Patriots have kind of eschewed it, even in recent history, compared to how they were doing business, you know, five, seven, ten years ago. Is that directly, uh, I guess, a shift when Nick Casario left New England? He, that kind of fell apart in his absence, or is it, did it start even before that? So uh, my understanding is that it's been a little up and down. It was, there wasn't a hard line drawn between when he left or anyone else took over, or now Mac Rose in. But it's just that they're doing less of that kind of work than they used to. And the times that they did dabble or lean a little bit more on it, you know, obviously Belichick wasn't too keen on the results that came from it. So it, it's more of a, you know, their, their standard day-to-day -day operation. There's not a check-in with an analytics staff. They don't have anyone listed in their media guide as being, you know, an analytics person they have a software engineer uh and that's about it and when you look at other places you know publicly listed media guides you have analytic staffs of 5 10 sometimes 15 20 people in the building every day you don't have that in new england andrew uh after the story came out jones and mego and i all sort of argued about what the story was about was it a mac jones story was it a <laughs> bill belichick story you wrote the thing what what is it it's the they're intertwined because mac jones's downfall from you know, promising rookie who was a Pro Bowl alternate and the, potentially the next face of the franchise, down to where he is now as a completely lost starter in the NFL. It took just 21 months. Like I don't know if we've seen a faster fall, particularly with an organization that is respected as the Patriots are, or at least were, uh, anywhere in, in recent NFL history. And so this is about not only just how Mac responded to what I would fairly describe as a lack of roster building around him, but also the failure to see key needs and roster holes like right tackle all of last year and not address them this year or receivers who can separate in a lack of investment. So the, the bleep has hit the fan and everyone is wearing it. That That's the essence. Ew. Of the so, yeah, it's uh, it's a bit yucky, but that's how the uh, the Patriots are. We're talking yeah, to Andrew, it's a fan. Andrew you Callahan. You don't want to be wearing it. We're talking to Andrew Callahan of the Boston Herald. He joins us here on WEEI. Um, so part of the reason I, I push back a, a, a little bit on the the roster pieces around Mac, and look, that's that's obviously a big issue. But part of the reason I lean Mac uh, in that debate, if you will, is be, there was a quote in the story, and I was just trying to go through it quick and, and refresh my memory on where this came from. It was an executive in the league or a scout in the league that said, well, the book was out on Mac late in his rookie year. 
And so I, I don't know if that's a consensus opinion, but is that an opinion that's shared around the league that, well, Mac had a nice run, but by the end of the rookie year, they already figured him out. And then from there, he's fallen further and further each season. So the numbers don't entirely support it, but I think when you look at Mac as a prospect, like we can go back to him. We were all trying to learn about him. They had drafted him. Who is this guy? Smart, accurate, processes well, supposedly makes good decisions, but it's going to be limited to basically working in the middle of the field. And so I think teams began to pack the middle of the field like they did in 2021, not only to prevent that, but they had a good running game going. And so Mac was able to find spots at the intermediate levels where linebackers had stepped up against the run game and still work over the middle of the field. But when the running game, like last year, or this season especially, has not been there, he can't throw outside. He is the worst thrower outside the numbers in the NFL this season. It was among the worst throwers deep a year ago. So again, that's where it kind of gets intertwined. I don't think there was a game plan that everyone since has replicated. Like teams are approaching the Patriots differently this year than they did a year ago. But as far as it comes to defending Mac, you get any kind of pressure on him and he melts and we want him to throw outside because he's just flatly not very good at it and hasn't been as far as anyone really watched him dating back to Alabama. As you bring up game plans, do you anticipate anything being significantly different with the offense going into Sunday's game or at least looking different to us as outsiders just observing the game so it's funny adam Schefter kind of hinted at this i don't know if it was on mcafee or elsewhere in a way that i know more yeah i know more than i'm saying and so i have like a small kind of like heart attack about oh my god is matt getting traded what does this mean and start making texts and calls and i haven't gotten anything back on that front and we got a lot of course on max this week as you can see in the story and when you look at the roster, also, I don't know what the other options would be. If you're sticking with Mac, only so much can change otherwise because, okay, great, you know, play Tyrone Wheatley Jr. at right tackle. Like, that doesn't change much from Vidarian Lowe or Calvin Anderson. The only thing that I think is possible, especially in light of Belichick's comments today, is that they reintroduce Malik Cunningham for maybe five or ten snaps at quarterback and unlock kind of an absent running game because we saw this in practice. They've done it. They've, they've worked on it. They did it in the preseason. He had one drive. It was great. But that's the only change that I can see. Because, like, there's, there's no one else on the roster or practice squad you're going, this person is going to change my life for the Patriots offense. But Andrew, he's the only guy that might might be able to do that. Tell me you want to see that. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. No, he wants to see more pick sixes. I, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> no, like, of I didn't know if he was going to look down his nose at it and say, we're all dummies because we saw one drive in preseason and he's not ready to play in that spot, even if they put together a very specific package for him. And I like that you're on board. Andrew, uh, it's not going to be Tyrone Wheatley. The injury report just came out, and he is ruled out, so it won't be him. But uh, on the topic of the backup quarterback, do you look at sort of that weird revolving clown car of uh, transactions that were there and backup QB with Ian Book and all these other people and you know all this weird stuff that happened over the course of the summer up to the point where it is now? Do you look at it any differently now that Mac Jones is basically broken? No, because that revolving door is more about Bailey Zappi. Like, that I can mm-hmm. tell you for a fact. I mean, someone told me flat, he stunk. That, that's not my word I've been using for weeks now about Bailey Zappi in the preseason. Kind of sounds like Giardi. <laughs> Maybe also stink and stank. Like <laughs> yeah, no, those are the uh, the receivers. But, you know, for Zappi, they're, they're unhappy with him. Like, Doug has reported that he was a little slow to pick up the offense this offseason. We saw it when they got into practice. And then on the field, he he's the least accurate quarterback in the NFL. It's a tiny sample. But, like, 41%. That's lower than Al Horford's three point percentage last year. Okay, like that. That's just you have to put the ball where you need to, and Billy Zappi's not doing it. And honestly, I think if he did in the last couple of games, even in mop up duty, he might be starting on Sunday. But that's how bad he's been. They want a new backup quarterback, and yet this is also the worst time to do that because you bring in Will Greer. Not only is he learning a new playbook, but he's not practicing against a starting defense. He's not involved in the game plans. He's simulating the opposing quarterback for the other team as the scout team quarterback. So he's pretending to be Dak Prescott and then Derek Carr or Jimmy G this week. He's not getting his own reps as Will Greer. Uh, before we let you go, uh, we've been talking today about something Tomazi wrote at NBC Sports Boston, that Bill is now the worst coach in the city, which I think there's merit to. Uh, as much as you can extract Bill Belichick, the GM, from, from all of the, the mess that's going on with the Patriots, is Bill still a good coach? I mean, Bill's calling timeout, so he's got one up on Joe Mazzulla, I think, right there, right? <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. Has Bill had good ti- has Bill been good with calling timeouts? Was Bill good situationally? I mean, come on. We, is Bill, hang on, but Andrew, is guy, Bill good situationally? He doesn't feel good situationally since 12 walked out the door. He doesn't feel good situationally for four years. 
I wouldn't characterize it like that. I would just say as bad as it's been, and it's 26 and 30 or whatever it is since Brady left. Like the guy's resume is unparalleled in NFL history. And I don't think he forgot to coach as soon as Tom Brady put on a Buccaneers uniform. The, the roster stuff is the worst part of this. Like make, make no mistake about it. And Bill could absolutely be better. I don't think he's been one of the better coaches in the NFL for the last few years. So there, there's but like never... Bill Mazzula's coached one season with the best roster in the NBA and almost got knocked out. Yeah, he made, an East, he made an Eastern Conference final. final. Bill's never, Bill hasn't made an AFC title game without Brady. So let me, let me ask you this. Uh, coaches just never lose it? They never just get old and lose it? That never happens? Yeah, but if, if he's lost it, like what has Joe Missoula gained? That, like, that, that's the argument here. Like, I, what, make the case for Joe Missoula. Like, this, this guy. He's at least won a playoff things. game in the series recently, unlike oh. Bill. Not without Jason Tatum yeah, and Jalen Brown. No, it's true. Tatum, Tatum, Tatum's never won a championship. Every round. Yep, no, that's fair. Like, uh, but he won two rounds last however, year. Bill's won two playoff games in like 12 years without Brady. And you know what? They underwhelmed in those rounds. Like the Hawks got them to six. Where did that come from? The Sixers got them down 3-2. Yeah, like, no, I mean, look, no, look. I guess I, I don't want to defend Joe Missoula. As I've been saying all day, there's no real wrong answers with this. All the coaches kind of stink these days. <laughs> but I, I, w- I think I would take what Missoula did last year. I would over Bra- uh, Belichick these days. But, Andrew, we can uh, pick this up another time. We appreciate it. Uh, make sure you read his coverage in the Boston Herald, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. All right, Andrew Callahan, as all our guests, joins us on the Harbor One Hotline.